Baseball has a baseball problem, but it's not what you think. Yeah, there are issues at the major league level every season, it seems. So much so that the actual pitcher, Adam Adovino, hopped into the comments of my substack to claim that in 2023, they were dealing with two clearly different baseballs. With the Mets video board posting movement information, so a guy like Justin Verlander knew when to switch balls out. And trust me, we'll get to the major league ball at the end of this video pretty briefly, but I still think it's important. I want to share something else about the minor league ball. Yeah, less exciting, but stay with me. The baseball that's used the three levels below AAA is fundamentally different than the baseball used in the major leagues. And it has a massive impact on pitching development through the minors. So I obtained some non-public below AAA pitch shape data and I paid somebody much smarter than me to model it all out. And now I have a pretty basic understanding as to how using the minor league baseball instead of the major league baseball affects pitch shapes and the magnitude of that difference. We're gonna put Rob Manfred on the chopping block for the 2025 Major League Ball at the end of this video. But before that, I encourage you to stick around and learn about the weird nuance of minor league baseball. The root of the difference in the minor league baseball is that those minor league balls are manufactured in China, while the major league ones used at AAA in the majors are manufactured in Costa Rica. They're cheaper, which is primarily connected to the materials used in the manufacturing process. And that makes sense. Major League Baseball goes through 290,000 balls in a given season. Even if the balls are switched out, let's say 10 to 20% less frequently in the minors compared to the majors, and the minors play less games on average, that's still probably about 200,000 balls a level. And you have three levels below AAA using these cheaper baseballs. So we're talking over a half a million baseballs combined for those three levels. If we theorize that you'd save maybe five to 10 bucks by going to this cheaper ball, you're looking at a cost savings of around $2 million. Put another way, you're saving one whole Mike Talkman or Ryan Yarborough, electric, I know. The main theme is that the seams are slightly larger on the minor league baseball, and it's not wound as tight as the major league baseball, so it feels different. So it's no real surprise that pitches move differently. And if you're making inferences here, it's probably pretty obvious that when you have higher seams, what you're doing is creating more movement. So in the minor leagues, the ball moves more, and then you jump to the majors, and it generally doesn't move as much. This was something I ran into continually in the minor league data that I look at. It frustrated me so much that when Vivian Pelletier, a PhD student at Arizona State, answered another question of mine about pitcher extension in a matter of minutes, I knew the exact person to call on for this project. The question here was how much does the minor league baseball influence pitch shapes? From a 30,000 foot view, this is what we're looking at. Basically every pitch type is getting some kind of haircut compared to that exact same shape if thrown with a major league baseball. For example, this is saying that four seamers lose about 8% of their vertical movement and 24% of their horizontal movement. This blanket adjustment, however, is missing some nuance. Here's a fancy graph showing how vertical movement, that carry which makes fastballs have a visual rise effect, changes when a pitcher switches to a major league baseball based on the spin efficiency of that pitch. The dotted line here means no change. The dots more on the right of this plot are more efficient, bigger, two planey fastballs like the ones, say, Shota Imanaga throws or Kevin Gossman. Whereas the ones biased a bit more to the left would be thrown by guys like Tyler Glass now or Dylan Cease, a bit more cut to them. But lost in this oceany blue mass is that the amount of carry you lose changes based on how efficient your spin is. Basically, if you cut your fastball, you're in a slightly better spot than if you're a big two-plane fastball guy. And now I have a formula which you are able to use if you want to adjust for a shape you see below the AAA level. So for example, this tweet I sent out the other day about Gerangelo Sancha, pitcher for the Mariners. He's a switch pitcher. Yeah, he throws with both his left and his right hands. If you want to adjust these shapes which I sent out, which are unadjusted, you would get a better picture of what he eventually would look like in the major leagues. What you do is head over to my Google Sheet right here. You plug in the current vertical and horizontal break of the pitch, along with the spin efficiency, which is pretty key, and you get an estimation of what that shape will be when the pitcher touches a Major League Baseball. You can see Sancho's numbers in here right now, but how about another guy? The hard-throwing arm for the Nationals, Harleen Susana. He sat 100 miles per hour in the minors last year. Yeah, he's a starting pitcher sitting 100, and he has an 87% spin-efficient four-seam fastball that had 14 inches of vertical break and 11 inches of horizontal. When we plug that in to our calculator, we would see the expected shape for him if he picked up a Major League Baseball right now 
or he was promoted up to the major leagues, and that would be 13 inches of vertical break and eight and a half inches of horizontal break or arm side movement. Still around is 100 miles per hour of velocity. You may say, well, I don't care. I don't know what any of those numbers mean. And honestly, if you made it through about five minutes of this video and don't know what vertical break is, I'm very impressed. I appreciate you sticking around, but we can contextualize this. With Susana, that first shape we're talking about, the OG shape that he had in the minor leagues, if that shape existed in the major leagues for him, it would be a plus fastball. So better than 85% of major league fastballs right now. That's a really good pitch, right? Especially for a minor leaguer. When we adjust that shape, what happens is it becomes more above average. So between your average and that plus is in this above average window. That would kick it down such that it's only now better than let's say 65, 67 or so percent of major league fastballs. That's a pretty big cut for a four seam in particular, especially one that this guy throws a good amount of the time. So you could see how the minor league ball affects your eventual projection as to how especially fastballs will play at the major league level. So I was pretty happy about this finding, right? We're looking good. Everything is accounted for. We actually made some park factor adjustments, at least Vivian did in this model that she built for me. We're all set, right? Right? No. When I asked around in the sport for perspective on the ball and how teams internally approach these changes, what I realized is that how the major league ball interacts with the air in flight is different with the minor league ball than it is with the major league ball. This is that concept known as seam shifted wake or seam effects, which I've done some videos on in the past. Essentially, how is the air moving around the ball and how can we influence the seam orientation of the ball to take advantage of that kind of movement? One source of mine high up in a major league organization told me this. He said, the major league ball just interacts differently with the air. And that matters even more for guys who rely on seam shifted wake. With seam shifted wake, the magnitude and directionality are key. So if a guy's changeup say had negative six vertical, negative six horizontal from seam shifted wake with a minor league ball, but that shifts to negative 10 vertical, negative three horizontal with a major league ball. That is a different pitch. It affects command and it changes how a hitter sees it. So yeah, smarter teams are modeling seam effects such that they can look and almost anticipate how the ball may be impacted or they're at least modeling out Magnus movement versus the seam effect movement and looking at the guys who rely more on seam effects such that when those guys start to get to the major league ball, perhaps they may have to make some orientation differences or feel differences, et cetera, to get that guy back into the movement profile that they want. Now, this causes me to unfortunately say that the confidence I have in my little project here wanes slightly as we move towards pitches that are more common to interact with the SEMA effects. But I do think in the aggregate, it is a very valuable tool, especially when you see any shape on the internet that is with a non-Major League Baseball and you think to yourself, wow, that is insane. We do not have a shape like that in Major League Baseball. Well, yeah, it's because the ball is different. So that shape probably doesn't exist in the majors. And the ball might be different in the major leagues as well, or maybe not. Eno Saris had a tweet that pointed to the publicly available drag numbers on the major league baseball, suggesting there's no real year over year change, especially when looking relative to the other first 10 or 20 days of a regular season. Tom Tango from major league baseball followed up by saying there was basically no difference as well between any of the last three seasons. However, Dr. Meredith Wills, who's done great work on the ball in the past seems to think that there is some difference, at least in the core of the baseball, which was interesting. But that thought from Adam Adovino stuck around long enough in my head for me to send other messages to people in baseball, pitching coaches, assistants, analysts, etc. And the basic question I asked is, what do you think's up with the 2025 Major League Baseball? The responses I got varied. I got, no, stop it. The more educated and difference right here from another source, the more conspiratorial they change it all the time, which is always a fun one. I think the balance here is that I'm asking a lot of pitching people who I believe are more naturally skeptical. But I, I also think that the consistent theme in talking to other people about this is that pitchers and coaches can pick up on this stuff when maybe the zoomed out aggregate data that we're looking at probably can't. So perhaps this is some weird version of the ball that pitchers are having trouble with in small instances, or I don't even know if I would say it's trouble. They're actually getting on average some more interesting shapes. Some guys are picking up vertical break where I just didn't really expect to see increases in vertical break. I'm talking about guys like Spencer Schwellenbach and Yoshinobu Yamamoto. There's no strong differences in release height there. They're just having better shapes, a couple inches here and there in terms of vertical break, and they seem to be benefiting. Now, I don't know if that's a byproduct of the ball or the ball they were using in an individual game, but I do feel like I'm striking the balance here. I'm playing Switzerland where I don't necessarily know which side to lean on. My main takeaway in all this is that MLB continues to say that the balls are manufactured within a window of variance, a tolerable window of variance, however you want to put it. 
And I think it's clear that the bounds of that variance, as one source told me, can cause material differences on a pitch-to-pitch -pitch basis. And what we really need to do is cut open these baseballs and examine them over long periods of time. And as to whether that's actually ever gonna happen in a league study, I doubt it. But that is probably the only way we're gonna get an answer. So do I believe the Major League Baseball is different this season? Yeah, but it's probably different every season. So I'm not entirely sure if we can isolate and say it's affecting certain guys more than others. And in reality, I do believe some of the larger aggregate data that says that maybe it doesn't have a massive material impact on the sport when you zoom out from that airplane 30,000 foot view. But on an individual level, I don't think I'm gonna stop getting these texts that are like, hey, there's something up with this. Look at his vert in this game. That is a very fair case. And I will also say, if you think this extends to college, you would be absolutely correct. This is a baseball I got. Let's see if I can get it to zoom up here. If not, I'll show another picture of it. From a college game that was actually played at Sloan Park in Arizona a couple years ago. I was walking back to my hotel and there's a foul ball hit. And Jacob Wilson was actually playing in that game for Grand Canyon University. And I don't know if it was off his bat, so perhaps this is somewhat of a valuable ball. But this problem happens in college as well. I had one source tell me that in the major leagues, you have a baseball. When you go to the minor leagues, that baseball's on steroids. When you go to college, that baseball is on even more steroids. He, him implying that the pitch moves even more. And that's why you end up with even wackier shapes in college. And then when you go to high school, it's an absolute mess. And that ball's on three times the amount of steroids. So you're getting inflated movement in a variety of situations. This adds to the complexity of baseball and grading out pitches and understanding shapes. And the reality is that I notice a lot of teams or at least talking to them are more so almost focused on things like spin capacity, velocity, and rele release traits. And they don't even necessarily dig into these shapes that I'm talking about until that guy gets to the minor leagues, which is why I think this topic is so important overall. So we have major league ball problems, some minor league ball problems, and the reality is that you could tell I'm probably somewhat of a voice for all these people that have to deal with these problems. But I find this stuff fascinating. I hope you do as well. If you made it to the end of this video, then yeah, I imagine you do find this stuff fascinating as well. And I just want to thank you for watching as always, and I'll see you soon.